Fronteiras do Pensamento apresenta a segunda parte da conferência As Importantes Lições da Religião, especialmente para ateus, com Alain de Botton. No programa de hoje, o escritor suíço apresenta as características da educação secular, colocando religião e moralidade como caminhos alternativos às formas modernas de se viver. Acompanhe! If culture is going to replace scripture, then after a lecture on Shakespeare or Montaigne, we should say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Probably all of us should stand up and we should say, you know, thank you Plato, thank you Montaigne, thank you Shakespeare. Get a little bit of energy going. You know, why is it that the energy is always taking place in the churches and the lectures are so polite, everyone's falling asleep. It's so true, it's so interesting, but it's so boring. So, that's what I think we should be doing. The other thing, the other thing, you can stand up and say amen, amen, if you get uh, uh, carried away. Now, the other thing that we should learn to do is to use our bodies when we learn. Religions are all really good at learning, not just through the mind, but through the body, something we completely forget in secular culture. Take the Zen Buddhists. The Zen Buddhists, if you read about Zen Buddhism, a lot of Zen Buddhism is about how fragile life is, how short life is, um, a kind of tenderness a sweetness that comes from recognizing that you are mortal and everyone around you is mortal. The kindness that comes from a mutual mortality. Now, there are lots of essays and, and, and books about this, but the Zen Buddhists also think that sometimes we should sit down with a group of friends and have a cup of tea and rehearse these messages. This is the famous Zen Buddhist tea ceremony, a deeply charming idea where a, a, a cups of tea are brewed in a ritual way in a specially designed tea hut so that a lesson in philosophy is given extra force by the drinking of a beverage. Um, this combination of food and drink and ideas is so special to religion, something we completely forget. We see because we are so materialistic, we see food as a lovely thing that satisfies the stomach. We have completely missed out on the idea uh, that food should be part of a lesson. But all religions don't. They all remember uh, this. And it's not just the appetite that's used, it's the whole body. You know how it is when you go and have a bath and you're sitting in the warm water and you feel kind of renewed and sometimes you feel a kind of optimism and you're thinking about your life. Okay, religions take that moment and they ritualize it. In the Jewish religion, every Friday, if you're an Orthodox Jew, you will go and have a special ritual bath called a mikveh, specially constructed, often very beautiful. You will go into the water, uh, you, you will submerge yourself totally, and you will come out feeling cleaner not just physically, but psychologically. A beautiful combination of a moral, psychological lesson and a physical act. And religions often do this. Okay, enough about education. Let's move on to something else. Let's move on to art. Let's look at how religions use art. And again, let's steal from them. Now, the secular world thinks that it really loves art. You know, any, any uh, uh, town these days is always very keen to build itself a museum. A lot of money goes into to, to art. And you sometimes hear people saying, you know, we don't build cathedrals anymore, but museums, they are our new uh, cathedrals. It's a beautiful idea. I also think it's nonsense. It's rubbish. It doesn't work. Now, why doesn't it work? It doesn't work for two reasons. Firstly, that artists have gone really wrong. In the 19th century, artists started to believe one of the most misleading, nonsensical terms that has ever been made. And that is the idea that art should be for art's sake. You know that famous phrase, art for art's sake. In other words, artists should not work for anyone else, the king or the queen or the political party. They should be independent. Now. That's one way of interpreting it. But it's been taken to mean that art doesn't have a function. It doesn't have a purpose. It doesn't want anything from you. It exists in this lovely, beautiful world called the art world. It's not trying to do anything. So that's the myth number one, which has been terribly hurtful to the mission of art as I see it. Um, the other thing is, uh, we also believe that art should not really explain itself. Um, 
And that's why many people, when you go into a museum, particularly a modern museum, the dominant feeling that you feel is, what does this mean? Uh, what's gone wrong? Now, if you're a well-educated, nice person, like everybody is in this room, you don't ask because you're polite and you know. So you, you, you're just a bit puzzled, don't really know what's going on, and you know, after a while you go to the cafeteria and you don't really know. But there it is, that was the Tate Modern, and you went to London, you had a great time at the Tate Modern. Anyway, okay. Now, religions are not like this at all. They are very, very simple when it comes to art. They've created some of the most wonderful art in the history of humanity, but they're very simple about the mission of art. The purpose of art is to remind you what there is to love and to remind you what there is to be afraid of and to fear and to run away from. And the purpose of art is to remind us in a way that an essay, that a book, will never be able. Uh, uh, religions recognize that we are a mixture of the physical, the sensory, and the intellectual, and it knows it has to attack us from every corner. So it gets the artist, the best artist in the world, to make exactly the same point as somebody else made in a book, but it helps to make it in another way, through a piece of music, through a, a, a canvas, through a, a sculpture. So if you look at something like Rembrandt's famous painting, The Crossing of the Sea of Galilee, it shows Jesus crossing the Sea of Galilee. It's a stormy night. It's a very stormy night. And now what is this picture for? It's a beautiful work of art. It has a very simple function. It's there to remind you of the courage of Jesus Christ. Very simple. And it works because Rembrandt was a genius. So he was able to take a very simple, banal sentence like the courage of Jesus Christ, and he makes you feel it. So that you look at the painting and you go, aha, that's what courage is. Ah, now I remember. It makes you remember what you thought you already knew but had forgotten. So many of the lessons that Christian art brings about are not intellectually new. They're very familiar. They're about bringing to life something that had died. If you like, Christian art is a form of propaganda. Now, propaganda is a very dangerous word. Most nice people, when they hear the word propaganda, it's not too long before they mention Hitler and Stalin. I want to, by the way, a lot of what I'm mentioning today, people will be thinking Hitler and Stalin. Uh, I'm standing on a slope. At the bottom of that slope is Hitler and Stalin. But I'm not at the bottom. I'm in the middle. And I think we can be in the middle of that slope. We don't have to fall down. And I think we can use propaganda. Christian art is a form of propaganda, not for something terrible like the murder of one race by another. It's propaganda on behalf of something very nice, the brotherhood of man, the friendship between people, etc. And I think that art can afford to learn the best lessons from propaganda. We shouldn't run away from that word uh, too soon. The other thing that religions remember is if you have a message, you need some buildings. You need a building. Don't just write books. Build some buildings. I had the great pleasure today of going to visit a building that I'd long to see. I'd only ever seen it in books, and that is Porto Alegre's positivist temple. It's temple for atheists. Most of you here probably don't know it very well. It's a very forgotten building here. But it's a wonderful building put up in the spirit of uh, the French sociologist Auguste Comte, who in the 19th century realized that when religion declines, we need something to replace it. And that's something he called positivism. And he also believed that positivism was going to need some buildings. So he suggested that every town gets a temple. Um, now, this never really took off apart from Brazil. Brazil has two or three of these temples. There's one half of one in Paris, and otherwise they didn't catch on. It's a little bit of a crazy idea. Positivism is a bit of a crazy idea, but it's a very, very interesting idea. We should learn best crazy ideas. There's often something there. And really, it's the idea that with the end of building simply for religion, we don't have to stop building things that look like temples. We all have values. We all have things we worship and think are very important. It could be the love of children. It could be respect for one's neighbors. It could be love of a nation, whatever it is. All these ideas also deserve architecture. Architecture is a wonderful way of solidifying and honoring an idea. And the concept that simply because we don't believe anymore, we should stop building, that that tremendous energy that went into cathedrals and churches should simply come to an end. Um, seems to me wrong, and I think there is a, a, a room for, for learning lessons there. Okay, moving on. Um, 
Something else that's really interesting about religions, very basic point, we almost forget about, uh, forget it, but religions are institutions. And in the modern world, um, if you're a person who's involved in the needs of the spirit, if you're someone who you know, is interested in the soul, um, the higher things, the things of the mind, um, it's almost certain that you will work on your own. I in matters of thought, we believe in the individual. We're very individualistic. So if you're a writer, if you're a poet, if you're a therapist, if you're a painter, you're on your own. You've got a little office somewhere, um, you work from home, that kind of thing. That's like me. Okay, so you're an individual. Um, that's a big problem. That's a really big problem. Um, religions, by contrast, are institutions. And that means they have all the advantages that come from institutions. The first one is wealth. The Catholic Church last year pulled in $97 billion. So sometimes people say things like, why, why does religion still, you know, why is it still so powerful? Why does the Catholic Church manage, you know, still to persuade? Look, look at $97 billion. That's a really good start. When I went to see the uh, 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 positivist temple in uh, Porto Alegre, I said to them, uh, so do, do you, you know, how, how, how do you have uh, any money? They said, oh, we have no money. I said, really not no money? No, we have, we have no money at all. Uh, they said, we, we, we don't even know if we'll be open in, in a month's time. No money. So $97 billion and no money. So, um, you know, the, the richest writer on the planet, on the planet, only uh, managed to earn $40 million last year, James Patterson. So you've got, you know, $97 billion and $40 million, and that's the richest per writer on the planet. In other words, the individual writer is pathetic, is a tiny speck of dust. No wonder no one listens. No one listens because the writer is on their own. So even if it's a great idea, it's never going to work. Um, religions are collaborative. They believe in pooling together the intelligence of a wide variety of people. Religions are branded. They believe in an identity that is stable. They don't believe in local uh, difference. They believe in international uh, uh, coherence. They are, if you like, multinationals. They are universals, and they are very disciplined. The only thing that we have nowadays that is comparable to religions in this area, uh, in, in this way, is multinational corporations. But they're in the business of selling you shoes and cars. So in other words, there is nothing that the modern secular world has in the area of the soul, of the spirit, of our higher mental functioning, that in any way compares with the power, the coherence, the discipline of uh, 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 religions. And I believe that's wrong. I believe that there's a lot to learn for secular thinkers about the need to institutionalize. Books alone are not going to do it. The collective is better uh, than the lone. There's something very important about multinationalism. Ideas are multinational. They need ex a multinational uh, uh, expression. All this we can learn uh, from uh, 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 religions. Um, two other things just to mention very quickly, things we can steal from religions, community. You know, religions are wonderful at creating a feeling of community. Nowadays you hear people saying things like, you know, there is a modern answer to community, it's called Facebook. Social networking, that's going to create communities. Now, Facebook is great. The problem is it doesn't really make communities because on Facebook you say what you like. I like, you know, dancing and I like uh, football and I like all these things. And then the machine sticks you together with other people who, who like this. Religions are more interesting. They believe that a real community is not about trying to get you to meet people you already like or have lots in common with. The true challenge is to get you to meet people that you don't really like who seem a bit strange, who are a bit odd, who you're frightened of, but you happen to live in the same part of town as them, but you've never said hello. This is community. The encounter uh, between people who are perhaps suspicious. And religion acts, religions have been wonderful ways of acting like hosts. You know how it is when you go to a party. Some parties, everybody's standing like this, maybe not in Brazil, but a lot in England. Everybody's standing like this, no one's talking, everybody's just got their drink, and you know, it's a bit sad. Um, but sometimes there are great hosts, and the host will say, hey, you can talk to this person, or you talk to that person, and suddenly everybody's talking. Um, 
And religion, if you like, without any disrespect, is a giant host. It functions as a host. The modern world doesn't have very many hosts. We have a lot of places where you can go and be with people. You have very few people who act as these agents of introduction. Um, and that's something that religion is particularly skilled at doing. Another thing that religion should teach us about is traveling. You know, before travel was for leisure and pleasure, travel had a religious purpose. Um, for thousands of years, travel was about pilgrimage. What is a pilgrimage? A pilgrimage is a journey that you undertake to a particular place to heal yourself through contact with something special about the place you've come to see. In Christianity, it's normally the remains of a saint. You will touch the tooth of Saint Agatha, and your own teeth won't hurt so much. Um, this sort of thing. Now, um, many of us don't believe in this sort of thing anymore. However, I think the ambition behind pilgrimages remains really interesting. The idea that we should use travel not as a diversion, not as an escape, but to accomplish a particular transformation, an inner transformation. I look forward to a day where when you go to a travel agent, that conversation is not only about a cheap ticket and a best hotel, but about what kind of personal evolution you are trying to accomplish through traveling. Um, and again, I won't go into it now, but religions have so many suggestions about how uh, that could be done. Okay, I'm going to bring things to an end because I've been talking a bit long, but really to sum up, Atheism 2.0. What is Atheism 2.0? It's a way of saying, even if you don't believe, religion is so rich in interesting uh, uh, lessons. In many, many walks of life, there are things you can take. Um, you know, if you're in any business that involves people, look at how religions bring people uh, together. If you're in the travel industry, look at pilgrimages. If you're in the art world, look at how religions treat art. Look at how they um, uh, bring out its most serious transformational function. And if you're in education, again, look at how religions um, uh, uh, not only choose the curriculum um, uh, to try and guide us, but also deliver information so that we will uh, uh, remember it. So there are so many uh, uh, effective lessons. And really, I want to conclude with the idea that religions are simply far too complicated, far too interesting, far too useful for us to leave them only to religious people. Thank you very much. Você acompanhou a conferência As Importantes Lições da Religião, especialmente para ateus, com o escritor suíço Alain de Botton. Obrigado pela sua companhia e até o próximo Fronteiras do Pensamento.